All right, if you have your Bible this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 12. And just be patient, we'll get there here in a moment. I want to quickly just catch you up to speed. Continuing this morning in our series, Legacy. And the big idea is this, that your life is standing for something. And you are leaving a legacy, whether you like it or not. You really have no choice in the matter. You're, you will be remembered for something. Your life is standing for something. The only choice that we have is what will that be? What will people, what will the next generation, what will future generations look back upon your life and what will you be remembered for? We have no say in the matter. Our lives are standing for something. And so this series is designed to just help us to, with intentionality, just dig in and say, how? God, how can we leave a legacy that matters? How can we live in a way that makes a difference in future generations? How can we live for something that outlives us? And how can we live in such a way that our life stands for something that, that stands beyond the, the temporal realm and makes a difference for all eternity? How do we do this? You know, as I was taking notes and just preparing to preach this sermon series, I, one of the first things I did is I just did a Google search and, and I looked for the definition of the word legacy. And I've shared it the last couple of weeks, but it bears repeating, I was appalled at what I found. And listen, you could go and do it for yourself. Pull your iPhone out, search definition of legacy, and this is the top result, the number one result according to the world. This is what they define legacy as, an amount of money or property left to someone in a will. And I read that, and I was appalled, and I was troubled, and I thought, oh, goodness, it's so much more than that. And the Lord just quickly began to speak to me and say, the reason that the world is in the condition that it's in is partly because it believes that this is what legacy is. And it's more than an amount or a, or a piece of property that we can leave in someone's hands. And listen, what we leave in people's hearts matters more than what we leave in their hands. What you leave in people's hands, they could spend it, waste it, blow it, but what you leave in people's hearts is what stands for all eternity. And that's what we want to be about. God, how can we live in such a way where we go beyond what the world says and how the world sees what legacy is, that we can leave a legacy of faithfulness, that we can live a, leave a legacy of godliness, that we can leave a legacy of character and integrity, that men of God, we can leave a legacy of what it looks like to serve our wives and serve our families, that women of God, we can leave a legacy for what it means to fulfill the purposes of God in your life in a way that the future generations look back and they say, I'm so grateful that grandma and grandpa were in our lives. They weren't perfect. They didn't have it figured all out. And they went through some problems, but they showed us how to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they endured some of those challenges and stood fast and allowed us now to look back and say, we have a heritage of faith. Listen, your life is standing for something. What will it be? How will you be remembered? You know, last week, I, I, uh, we talked about breaking generational iniquities. And listen, I don't do this very often, but I really feel compelled this morning to encourage you. If you missed last week's message, go back and listen to what God had to say about breaking free of some of these things that have affected us many times before we can begin to, to move forward and experience the fullness of what God has for our future. This thing that we're building that will one day be called legacy, we have to be able to be set free from the pain of our past. And we dug into what God's word has to say about this thing called generational iniquities. And Ezekiel 18 establishes that the child and the parent will not be held responsible eternally for the sins of one another. You will, you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and what you do with your life and what, how you respond to the invitation of salvation through Jesus Christ is what will be measured. So, so you're not eternally accountable for the sins of your parents, but what's also true is what Exodus 20 has to say. And it says this, that the sins of the parents, the previous generation, it says the entire family is affected. Verse five and six, Exodus 20. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but here's the good news. I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and keep my commands. The blessing of God through Jesus Christ is more powerful than the curse of sin. That's right. But we need to understand that, that the way we live matters. The way that we live, the decisions we make today are affecting the generations of tomorrow. How do we do this? How do we leave a legacy of faithfulness? How do we leave a legacy of godliness? 
Listen, the good news is, I've reminded us last week, when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, come on, I just want you to picture it this morning, the cross of Jesus Christ. Just picture it. Picture it in your heart. Picture it in your mind. And when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, it's so much more than just the instrument of Christ's crucifixion. We can look at it and just at a glance be, remount, be reminded about four, actually five profound truths. When we look at the physical cross, the two beings that intersect and one pointing upward towards God reminds us that the cross of Jesus Christ once and for all made a way for sin to be defeated and for relationship to be restored with a good heavenly father. That same beam that we look at and reminds us about relationship restored with God is pointing downwards and can quickly remind us that once and for all, the cross of Jesus Christ has given us victory over sin, death, and the grave. Come on, that's good news. We can look at the cross and we can be reminded. Come on, these, these iniquities, these things in our past that, that are hindering us or holding us back from really walking out this thing called legacy and living the best life that God's called us to live, we can look at the cross of Jesus Christ and be reminded when we look at that beam that goes left and right that the cross of Jesus Christ has made a way for our past to be dealt with, to be healed, to be restored, for us to be forgiven, for, for us to be restored. And that same beam that points towards our past is pointing towards a future, a good future that God has for you. And where those two beams meet, it reminds us that right where you stand today, God is with you. He's for you. He's an ever-present help, even in a time of need. Your life is standing for something. God wants to heal your past. God wants to bring restoration to some of the things that the enemy has stolen, and God wants to prepare you to begin to live in a new or a fresh way of faith so that we might leave a legacy. Come on, can we pray this morning? Come on, I'm going to pray over us corporately, but can I encourage you right where you sit this morning, you know your situation, your circumstances, what God is leading you through, the challenges, the obstacles, the, the victories, the losses, you know where you're at today. Would you pray and would you invite God to come this morning and speak to you and, and, and strengthen you and encourage you and equip you? Lord, that's our prayer this morning. We're here to do so much more than just have church. We're here to encounter a living God. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your presence and we thank you for the opportunity to gather as your people. And we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to visit your promises, which are your word this morning. And Lord, we thank you for strengthening us and equipping us, God, to begin in a new way, a fresh way to begin to live, move forward and live out in a way that allows us to leave a legacy of godliness and, and faithfulness and character that is Christ-like, God. And any of us who are here this morning and we're weak or we're weary or we're wounded in any area of our lives, God, physically, emotionally, relationally, God, spiritually, we thank you, Lord, that your heart today, you're a good father, and your heart today is to bring healing. Your heart today is to bring comfort. Your heart today is to bring strength, God. So that where we're weak today, Lord, we might be strengthened, so we might be able to begin to move forward to the call and the plan and the purposes of God. In the name of Jesus, and come on, all of God's precious people said, amen. amen. Are, you, are you there in Genesis chapter 12 this morning? Last week, we talked about breaking free of those generational iniquities, and this morning, I want to talk to you about how to leave a legacy of faith. And we're going to look at the life of Abraham, who discovered a thing or two about how to leave a legacy and a heritage of faith for future generations. And what we find in Genesis chapter 12 is Abraham encountering God, or God encountering Abraham, and, and God speaking and bestowing this blessing, this invitation upon Abram. And it says right here in, in verse 1, chapter 12 of Genesis, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. He's saying, there's some things that you're going to have to be willing to move out from. There's some things that you're going to have to be willing to think differently about. There's some things that you're going to have to be willing to do differently to serve me. And he says, get out to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Come on, that's a good promise, amen? amen. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. Galatians chapter three says that this is the blessing, this is the promise that we can have access to through Christ Jesus. It says it so specifically, through Jesus Christ, God has blessed us, the Gentiles, with the same blessing. Say, same blessing. Same blessing. The same blessing. He promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit 
through faith. Now turn a little bit back to Romans chapter 4. And we're going to pick this thing up. Genesis 12 just established the invitation, the blessing, the promise that God extended to Abraham if he was willing to step out of some things and begin to pursue God in a new way. And we just established that that's the very invitation that God has given to us, that he desires to bestow this same blessing, this same favor, this same provision that not only will, will affect our lives, but will affect generations to come. Come on, that's the invitation that he's given to us. That's good news. Can someone agree with me? So here we have in Romans chapter 4, following up, talking more, looking back, and giving an account of how Abraham in some ways was able to be faithful to this call of God upon his life, this invitation to leave a legacy of faith. And it says this in verse 16, Romans chapter 4, therefore the promise comes by faith. Come on, somebody say, by faith. By faith. So that it may be by grace, say by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who were of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Reading on, verse 18, it says, against all Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Catch this, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And this is why it was accredited to him as righteousness. The number one thing that we have to do if we're going to leave, if we're going to establish, if we're going to break free of some things and begin to leave a lasting legacy, a lasting heritage of faith, is get a promise from God. Get a word from God. Seek the Lord your God in your present circumstances and get a word from God. Le living a legacy of faith, living a life of faith compels us to dig into the promises of God, to get into the word of God. Listen, in the culture that we are in, there are a thousand opinions and they're increasing every day about how you and I should do marriage and how you and I should do family and how you and I should do life and finances and sexuality. But I'm encouraging you that what we need as the church of Jesus Christ is a returning to the very word of God. What does God's word have to say about how to do those things? What does God's word have to say about my family and my future? Living by faith requires us to get a word from God. But you know, Abraham didn't have a book that was neatly bound together with 66 books in it. He just had the presence of God and a, and a determination to leave a legacy of faith and live and walk by faith will draw us and compel us into the presence of God. Listen, God has a way of inviting us to things that cause us and call us and compel us and require us to do it well, to be fully dependent upon him. And if you're gonna live a, a life of faith, if you're gonna leave a legacy of faith, it's gonna require you to get in the word of God. And it's going to require you to pursue after the presence of God. And it's going to require you, I've got three Ps right there, to be connected to the people of God. Because to live a life of faith, we've got to get a promise, get a word. We've got to have something that we're shooting for, aiming for, running towards, walking towards. You know, the Bible says that without vision, without prophetic revelation, that the people cast off restraint. In other words, if I have nothing that God's shown me and God's invited me towards and that I've established and determined this is what I'm going to, to do, I'm going to be a godly husband and I'm going to be a godly father and I'm going to be a servant in my church and I'm going to make a difference in my community and my workplace. If I don't have that kind of a revelation of the invitation of God, why would I live the way that God's called me to live? But when I begin to grab a hold of a word from God, a promise from God for my life and for my home and for my family, it causes me to begin to say, Lord, that's what I'm after. That's what I want. And I, I'm willing to make different decisions. I'm willing to say no to some things, to say yes 
to what you've invited me to. To live a life of faith, to leave a legacy of faith. Come on, people of God. We got to go beyond just coming to church on Sunday mornings. We got to be willing to start getting in the word of God. We got to be willing to start getting in the presence of God. We got to stay connected to the people of God. Because I, don't, I can't tell you how many times in my life some of those words from God have come from, from another brother or sister in Christ who has come to me and delivered a prophetic word, a message from God that they felt the Lord was impressing upon their heart to share with me. And it became one of those words, one of those promises that I began to, to build my life towards and I began to take into consideration for the decisions that I was making. Because hear me this morning, there's a vision that God has for your life. But the pathway to your life's vision is always paved with daily decisions. Daily decisions. Every day, getting up and saying, today, this is who I will, this is how I'm going to live and who I'll stand for. We got to be connected to the word of God, the presence of God, and the people of God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3 says that he who brings a, a word from God, a timely word from God that the Bible calls a prophetic word, brings encouragement, brings comfort, and brings strength. How many of you could use some encouragement? How many of you could use some comforting for some things? How many of you could use some strengthening to continue to move forward to some things that God has invited you to and called you to? Come on, we got to get in the word of God, be in the presence of God, and stay connected to the people of God. Number two, get your hopes up. Number one is get a word, get a promise. Number two, is get your hopes up. And all of these things are going to start with get up, except for the last one. The last one stands alone. They're all going to start with G. All these things are going to start with get a, get a promise. And number two is get your hopes up. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, now faith is the substance of things what? Hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Listen, you live in a world that cautions you and warns you, don't get your hopes up. But I'm telling you, when you begin to hope in and trust in a God who is faithful and a God who is good and a God who has led you through some things before, you can begin to get your hopes up. Not because your hope is in your own strength or your confidence is in your own ability or your own intellect, but it begins to be placed in a God who is good and a God who is faithful. Get your hopes up. Come on, look at your neighbor. Come on, look at your neighbor this morning and say, get your hopes up. Get your hopes up. Get your hopes up for what God's doing. Listen, faith is the evidence, the evidence of things that are hoped for. What are you hoping for, people of God? Faith is pointing you towards those things. What are you expecting God to do in your life? What are you needing God to do in your marriage or your finances? God says, get your hopes up. Faith is pointing at something. It's pointing at what we're hoping for. And is it possible that so many of us, too many of us, hope for too little? God's word says that he desires to do more than we could ask, think, or imagine. He desires to do more. Can you believe that? Immeasurably more, the NIV says. To him who is able, he's able, he's able. Hear me, people of God, he's able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power, His power that works within us. Get your hopes up. Get your hopes up. Come on, I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning. But there's someone in this room, there's maybe more than one of us who there's something that we once were hoping for, there's something that we once were expecting God to do in our life. And maybe it didn't go exactly the way that you thought it would go, and maybe the door didn't open the way that you thought it would, and the enemy came, and the Bible says that hope deferred can begin to make your heart sick. But I'm telling you this morning, I believe by the Spirit of God that God desires to begin this morning, right now, real time, in this place, in his presence, to begin to breathe on those places once again. To begin to stir fresh hope and fresh faith for a new season. For a a new season of serving God, a new season of presenting those things before God and saying, God, I once believed you that you would do this or you would open this or that you would call me to this or that you would provide for this or that you would heal this. Lord, in this fresh season present that before you and I say, would you stir hope in my heart once again? There's power in expectation. We pray often as we're praying over you guys and praying over our services. Lord, let there be an atmosphere of expectation that primes the faith of God's people to receive what you desire to do in our lives today. There's power in expectation. 
There's power. Luke, Luke chapter 3, this is a powerful scripture that oftentimes get, gets overlooked, but I think it's significant. Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist is, is ministering and preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says this, it says, while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts, that was the atmosphere that ushered in the promised Messiah. For 400 years since Malachi had been written, there had been silence, but an atmosphere of expectation began to stir in people towards the promise of God to send the king, the Messiah. And in that atmosphere, John the Baptist was released to come and begin to prepare the way of the Lord. Expectation, what are you expecting? Come on, look at your neighbor this morning and say, are you expecting? Come on, that's a dangerous question to ask in church right there. I've made that mistake. So I just invited some of you to make that same mistake. I've made that mistake once before, and I swore to myself I would never, ever, ever ask another human being that question again, you know. There's no going back from that one. When you ask someone that question and the answer is no, you know. Truth be told, just last year, I actually went up to a precious gal in our church, and I asked her when the due date was. She was obviously expecting, Pastor Marcus. She was obviously expecting. I felt pretty safe about asking that question. And I, she just deadpan looked me right in the eye and said, what are you talking about, Pastor Thomas? <laughs> and she, the good Christian woman that she was, she must have saw the look of fear in my eyes and my life flashing before my eyes because she let me off the hook real quick. She said, it's okay, Pastor T, we're due in December. I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> but come on, look at your neighbor once again and say, are you expecting... Are you expecting, what are you expecting God to do in your life? Because faith is the evidence of things, what? Hope. hope for. Get your hopes up. Get a word from God. Get your hopes up. Number three, get a grip. Get a grip. When God speaks something over your life, when God speaks something over your marriage, when God speaks something over your heart, when God speaks something over your kids, whether it's from his word or whether it's, it's from directly from the heart of God as you're in his presence or whether it's from another brother or sister in Christ through a prophetic word, come on, grab onto that thing and don't let go. Amen. Take a hold of this thing. Get a grip. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, get a grip. Get a grip. Deuteronomy 13 verse 4 says this, serve only the Lord your God and fear him alone. Obey his commands, listen to his voice, and cling to him. Come on, whatever God speaks over your life that is a good and better promise for the way forward in your life and your future, take a hold of that thing and don't let go of it. How many people allow the enemy of their soul to talk them out of the promises of God for their life? Amen. Don't be that person. Take a hold of it. Take a hold of God's new and better word over your life and cling on to that thing. Come on with a white knuckle kung fu grip. And when Satan tries to come and tries to deceive or lie or destroy that promise of God, come on, you just look him right back and say, not today, Satan. I'm hanging on and holding on. I'm clinging. It says cling to him. Hebrews 16, verse 18 and 19 says, therefore we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence, not just a little confidence, great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Get a word from God. Get your hopes up and get a grip. Come on, take a hold of that thing that God is speaking over your life, regardless of what it looks like today, and hang on to that thing until it's fulfilled. Though the vision may tarry, though the promise of God may tarry, God's word says it surely will come to pass. Get a grip. Come on, look at your neighbor. Look at someone next to you. Say, get a grip. Get a grip. Come on. Come on, you guys could do better than that. Look at someone next to you. Say, get a grip, get a grip. Hang on to that thing. Number four, get moving. Get moving. Listen, we're called to live an active life of faith. God never intended for faith to just be a system of beliefs. And he never came. He didn't die on that cross to just establish denominations and buildings and, and a system of beliefs. He established a living, breathing, active church that's advancing and moving forward the kingdom of God. He said, on this rock, what's, what rock? The rock of who I am, the Christ, the son of the living God, the Messiah. I'll build my church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. And I've never seen gates on the move. Gates are static and gates are standing. It implies that the church of Jesus Christ is intended to be an active force, mobilized, 
preaching and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ, going about being the salt and the light and the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ to a world who desperately needs him. You're going to have to get on the move. You want to leave a legacy of faith? It's got to go beyond just a system of beliefs. And it's got to be something that we're living out. Come on, the legacy that you're leaving for your family and for those future generations is better caught than it is taught. You can say all that you want to say. Come on, it sounds good. Do what I say, not what I do. It sounds good. If only it worked, it doesn't work. You're called to live this out. Live an active life of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. I don't know what your life looks like today. I don't know what your marriage looks like. I'm just telling you, I don't know what it looks like in the natural realm by your sight, but the invitation of God is you can begin to walk towards the promises, towards the future, independent of how it looks on the outside. We walk by faith. Faith is not the absence of doubt or adversity. It's doing the right thing. It's moving forward. It's taking those steps in the midst of doubts, in the midst of adversity. And I, I love how it says we walk by faith. And listen, I get it. I know that there are places in the word of God that talk about the race that we are called to run. In fact, uh, um, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about the race. Let us run our race because we're there for because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that are outlined for us in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame of faith. Let us run this race. But you know, most times, God's more concerned about your walk. And most times, the, the thing that really needs to happen before you begin to run, and maybe there is a running, maybe there is an increase in the pace of how you begin to run out your faith and run out the call of God on your life. But for most of us, the key thing is just being able to take that first step. We walk by faith. We walk by faith. Listen, I don't know where you're at today, but I'm just telling you, regardless of where you're at today, the invitation of God is just come on, just take one step out of those circumstances and towards God. Just take that one step. Just take that one step. You might not see what it looks like over here. You might not see the future generations. You might not, not even have the faith yet to be able to see the marriage restored and healed. But maybe you can have just enough faith to just take that one step. What's your step today? I mean, really, take a moment. What's your step today? Maybe it's one person you need to forgive. One phone call you need to make. One commitment to tomorrow. Start off your day differently. And instead of turning to that thing or social media or whatever it is, to make one step, one decision to say, tomorrow I'm going to open my Bible and get into the promises of God. I've just found, I've discovered, we walk by faith just one foot right after the other. And you take one step towards God and then you just say, okay, God, now, What's my next step? What's my next step? And then you take that step. Come on, the most important step is always the next step. It's always the first step. And you'll be surprised if you look back or when you look back and you, you realize, wow, God, look what you have done and look where you've taken me to because I was willing to just say yes, to just take one single step at a time, to heed your voice at, the, at every stepping point, to say, Lord, where do I step now? We walk by faith and not by sight. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I'm just telling you, there's a, there's a pathway, there's a, there's a principle, there's an invitation that God has created that we can live by faith despite what, how things might look in our life. And I, I came across this illustration that I thought was really powerful. It kind of summed it up for me. In 1982, 70,000 people, football fans, rabid football fans, come on, where are my football fans at? Come on, you guys, are the, you guys are the ones hoping I get done preaching right now so you get home and watch the football games, right? 70,000 people packed into the home stadium of the Wisconsin Badgers to watch the Wisconsin Badgers face their, their adversary, the Michigan State Spartans. And throughout the first half, Michigan State was clearly the better team. Wisconsin was getting it handed to themselves. But the, the home crowd, the 70,000 people jammed into this stadium Somehow, for some reason, we're cheering loudly occasionally. Wisconsin would make a bad play, and yet the stadium would erupt in, in, in celebration and erupt in applause. And everyone was looking around saying, what in the world is going on? Here's what people on the sidelines didn't understand. 
that that day at the very same time that the Wisconsin Badgers were facing the Spartans, at the very same time the Milwaukee Brewers were winning game four of the World Series. And who knows, 20, 30, 40,000 of the people in the stands had their Walkmans. Remember your Walkman back in the 80s, you know, with the little dial on the top that could tune in the radio stations? And they had their Walkmans, and they were listening. They were watching Wisconsin lose, but they were listening to the Milwaukee Brewers win. People on the sidelines of your life might look at you celebrating and cheering and worshiping God and praising God and staying faithful to the call of God and look, say, but look at the scoreboard of their life. It doesn't add up with the sound that's coming out of them, and it's because we make a choice to tune to a different frequency. On the field, it might look like we're losing, but what we're hearing is the sound of victory. And it causes us to have faith. Come on, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Two, real quickly, and then we'll close. Worship team, you guys can go ahead and come up and prepare to help us to worship and dismiss. Second to last one, get real. Get real with God. Come on, we gotta get a word. We, 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 we got we to gotta get a word. We got to get a grip. We got to get our hopes up. We got to get moving. And we got to get real with God. One of the things I love and appreciate about the word of God is that it is filled with imperfect people who turn their real problems, real challenges, real adversity over to a real God who offers real grace, real forgiveness, and real strength to overcome those adversities and begin to live for him. Abraham was an imperfect person. He was a flawed person. Do you guys remember? He, he tried to pass his wife off as his sister one time in the Bible. You know, how many of you husbands know that's not, a good, that's not a recipe for a good night right there? This was an imperfect person. We got to get real with God. This, this invitation to live by faith is not an invitation or requirement to live perfectly. There's only one person, thank the Lord, that came and lived perfectly, and his name is Jesus Christ. And the, the, the opportunity to live this thing, a life of faith, a legacy of faith, we can't allow our own weaknesses or imperfections or previous struggles to cause us or keep us from stepping out and saying, yes, Lord, and beginning to take those steps. And look what it says about Abraham. It says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. God had promised him that he would be the father of many nations. God had promised him a, a, a son And it says he faced the fact, but he kept the faith. And I'm just telling you, the the faith in the God that we serve does not bow down or defer to the facts of your life. I, I mean, I'm just telling you, you might really have some real issues. There might really be, the bank account might really say what it says today. There might really be that stack of bills waiting for you. You might really be separated from your spouse. You might really have the diagnosis from the doctor, the letter that came from the, from the MRI place or whatever it is. You might really have those things and I'm just telling you today, you can face the facts and keep the faith. Face the facts. Living by faith is not turning a blind eye to difficult circumstances or challenges or obstacles. It's the very opposite. It's in the middle of those things taking a hold of what God has done and what God has said and said, you will see me through. You've seen it. You've done it before. You'll do it again. Lastly is grace. And I know all the other ones said get something, get get a word, get real, get a grip. And this one just deserves to just stand on its own. Just the word grace. Grace, 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 grace. You're going to live your life of faith. You're going to leave a legacy of faith by grace. And the Bible forever interconnects faith and grace. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved. How? Through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not by works. It's not by anything we could say. And We don't have to get smart enough. We We don't figure it all out. And finally we begin to live by faith. He says, it's not that way that any of us should should boast. It's the gift of God. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And the life of faith and the legacy of faith that you leave will always be discovered by the grace of God. Would you stand to your feet this morning? And let's prepare our hearts to respond. Come on, really respond to whatever God is speaking to you today. And whatever step that that is for you today, come on, that step of faith, that that walking out this thing, that walking of your faith. And I just want you, come on, we gotta move quick, but right there where you are, just ask God, Lord, what are you speaking to me? 
What are you speaking to me? Maybe a, you can make it even more specific. Lord, what's my step today? After, as I leave this service, what's my step? What's my next step? What, what would you call me to do, Lord, to begin in a new way, a fresh way, a more dedicated way to begin to live my life by faith in a way that I leave a legacy of faith? What's my step? Come on, just, just take a moment. Really, right there where you are. Lord, what, what are you speaking to me? What's my step? And just listen. Just listen. If we, if we come into the presence of God and we call upon him and we tell him all the things we need and all the worries and problems we have and we don't take a moment to hear what he has to say about it. We've missed the most important person in the conversation hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Take a moment and say, Lord, what, what are you speaking to me? What's my next step? Where did maybe I get off track in living this thing out that now you're inviting me to go back and just by your grace begin to just do it right. You're, it's never too late to begin to do the right thing. What's our step, Lord? What are you speaking to us? If you're here this morning, and maybe you once served God, maybe you grew up in the Christian church, and life has happened or whatever's happened, and you find yourself today far from God. You know God, but you're not really living out this thing. You're not living out your faith. Or maybe you're here this morning, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Experience what it feels like. Come on, it is an amazing feeling to have the full weight of your sin taken off of your shoulders. Or maybe you're here this morning and because of something God has spoken to your heart, you want to rededicate your life to begin to live this out in a new way. If that's you this morning, you fit in any one of those three camps or anywhere in between, come on, do not delay. Lift your hand high towards heaven right now. You are responding to God. And Lord, we thank you for these precious people and for these hands that are being lifted towards heaven. And what these hands being lifted towards heaven represents hearts that are turning towards you, hearts that are answering the call to come home, hearts that are hearing and heeding the voice of the Father that says, Son, daughter, you've been gone too long. I'm inviting you. Come home to me. And we thank you, Lord, for what it represents. God, lives becoming new. The Word of God says that he who is, is, is made new is a new creation, that all the old things are passing away. And so right now, as your hand is lifted in faith, the, we believe that what the Bible says is, is true is happening in your life. You're being made new, a new creation. God's extending to you an opportunity for a fresh start and a new life. Come on, Rev City Church, we are family, and we, we want to pray this prayer with you. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray this prayer with you for a couple reasons. One is it is our way of just saying right from the start, we want to come alongside you in your new life of faith and begin to walk with you and encourage you and speak over you and help you to become set free of some of those things that maybe have been holding you back so that you can begin to live this thing out in a new and fresh way. And the second reason is that it reminds us that we never graduate from grace. We pray this together as a family every week because it reminds us that today we need a Savior just as much as we did on the day we were first saved. So come on, church, with everything that's in your heart, let's pray this out today all together. Come on, lift your voices. Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could not pay to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you that life, and I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus, I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. Come on, someone ought to put your hands together for those precious people that responded to Jesus this morning and received. Come on, team, let's sing, and then Amity will come and dismiss us.